I started a new book this past week by a journalist, Jennifer Brenny Wallace. Uh, the name of her new book, just published last year in 2023, is called Never Enough. Never Enough, When Achievement Culture Becomes Toxic and What We Can Do About It. As you know, of course, there are a lot of studies, a lot of research out there about the um, challenges, the adverse circumstances that our nation's youth uh, faces in our current cultural moment, things such as poverty, violence, the breakdown of family structures, uh, failing schools, substance abuse. Well, in 2019, there was a national report published by some top developmental scientists that added another category of at-risk youth. Many students at high-achieving schools. Wallace's book, Never Enough, is about this phenomenon, the marked increase that she writes about in adjustment problems in youth who experience sustained pressure to excel in academics and sports and extracurricular activities in order to get into perceived elite colleges and universities. And she acknowledges some ambivalence, actually uh, writing about youth who, relatively speaking, are so privileged, so well set up in advance for success in life. But she describes toxic stress, her phrase, the pressure to achieve, that leads to anxiety and loneliness and depression, a failure to flourish as well-adapted, secure, and happy people. This is a quotation. What emerged from my research hit me like an ice bath. Our kids are absorbing the idea that their worth is contingent on their performance, their GPA, their social media followers they have, their college brands, not for who they are deep at their core. They feel they only matter to the adults in their lives, their peers, the larger community, if they are successful. And so she, she coins this, this familiar word to describe what needs to be addressed for these types of, of youth mattering, to know that you are valued, that you mattered for who you are and not for what you achieve. I was reading this and I thought, wow, to know that you matter, <laughs> I, that just seems like a fairly obvious and soft conclusion. Uh, but apparently this is a real issue, a big problem for many, many of our youth hiding in plain sight. So, um, a week from right now, God willing, we got one more week, I will have graduated from college three children, three for three. Thanks be to God. <laughs> um, we were grateful for that. Um, and uh, <laughs> the good Lord knows that Susie and I have made lots of mistakes as parents. Oh my goodness. But I don't think we've made this mistake. Um, do we want our children to succeed, to achieve in life? Of course we do. But I don't think any of the three of our kids have any suspicion that they matter to their parents if and only if they achieve and succeed in life. I would rather have one of my children not succeed by worldly standards and have a close relationship with them than that they would succeed by worldly standards and I do not have a close relationship with them. And I know that I'm not alone in this room in saying that. So is there any lie that is more pernicious, more antithetical to the gospel than the notion that you matter based on what you achieve? That your identity is determined by your level of success? Ugh. In relation to the kingdom of God, in relation to the life that is abundant life, what Wallace's research is about is fruitlessness in spite of achievement, a failure to flourish in spite of success. 
And so the challenge in this book I've just started it is what would it look like to prune back that kind of achievement-based culture even here at St. John the Divine? So we're in the 15th chapter of John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And a little farther down, further down, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. These are familiar lines from, again, John chapter 15. We are smack in the middle here of what is known as the farewell discourse, these uh, uh, final chapters before the crucifixion in John's Gospels, chapters uh, 13 through 17, where Jesus is offering on the night before he died for his disciples final loving acts, final exhortations, and final prayers. And here, in these verses, he's using simple agricultural metaphor to make a deep theological point. And of course, a familiarity with vineyards would have been, um, you know, universal, in Middle Eastern antiquity. And familiarity with the vineyard would have been universal to Jews uh, in their Hebrew scriptures. We don't have time to get into it now, but whenever you're in the Bible and you, you read about a vineyard, just know that's an image, that's a metaphor for covenant faithfulness. It's meant to suggest what a relationship with God looks like in all of its fruitfulness, or in some cases, a lack of fruitfulness. And so what I think is arresting about how Jesus uses this metaphor here is, you know, any amateur gardener can pretty quickly discern that if there's dead wood, dead branches uh, in a shrub, in a fruit-bearing plant, you cut it out, right? And he says that. But he says more than that. He says more than that. He says his followers are to cut back and to prune the already fruit-bearing branches, and this, of course, is a horticultural principle of creation. But again, I think, too, it's a, it's a critical spiritual principle at work here, too. Because bearing fruit and bearing more fruit and bearing more fruit eventually unchecked leads you farther and farther away from the vine, who is the Father. And that's the danger. So I've talked to folk before about this tendency in our cultural life toward accretion, that there's more and then there's more and then the more allows us to get even more that does not actually lead to flourishing lives, but just an unending appetite for more. We're no longer tied to the vine, so we have to prune back. And then what grows from that is even more fruitful. So the simple but stark word of the Lord speaking into our lives this morning is, if elements of your life are not leading you to genuine fruitfulness that is anchored in the fact that you matter more than you can possibly imagine to God, then get rid of it. Cut it away. Prune it. Jesus says, abide in me. You heard that word several times from the Greek verb here, meno, menain. I'm interested that, um, I think in the very first question that Jesus asks in John's gospel in chapter one, Andrew and a friend begin to follow Jesus. He turns it around and looks at him following him and he says, what are you looking for? And their answer to his question is kind of a specific question about where are you staying? It's the same verb, where are you abiding? And he says, come and see. And they came and abided with him where he was abiding. The same words, I, meant, I think we're meant to hear those echoes here in John chapter 15. What are you looking for? Abide with me, come to be with me where I am. So when we think about whether or not we need to prune 
various dimensions of our lives, we can ask at least two questions. I'd ask these questions. I think they're helpful questions. Is what I'm doing, is what I'm going after here really helping me to remember that I matter to the Lord already? Is, is this a response to mattering to the Lord? Or is it in some ways that I think I need to achieve something in order to matter? And then secondly, and related to that, is, is this helping me more and more to love the people that Jesus loves and to do the things that Jesus loves to do? What I'm doing maybe in a particular task or goal, Jesus probably doesn't care. Maybe I don't need to do it. What are you looking for? Is a leadership Christian guru, John Maxwell, who once said, I think humorously, but I bet you this is true. He's done a lot of interviewing of people for jobs and he tells employers the best place to take a person who's interviewing for a job is to a cafeteria. Why? Because you will immediately discern their capacity for priority, prioritization. <laughs> my experience when I go to a cafeteria is uh, I, I, I load up my plate with everything. We want it all. And it leads us further from the vine to social breakdown. Wanting it all may lead to no connection at all, at all to what matters most. So in this day and age, as we all know, we're all caught up in the, the churn and the chaos and the untethered dynamics of the day. And the sociological principle in all that is the more that people are churning and chaotic and untethered, the more that's going on internally, the more they take that out into society. And that is exactly what we're seeing right now. So what a holy calling. What a privilege we all have to offer a distinctive, well-differentiated witness to that. That we are centered as a people who really know who we are and why and how we matter to God. That we are tethered to grace that we abide in Jesus, that we find joy in, in what he has accomplished on the cross, way more than thinking we'll find our joy in only what we ourselves accomplish. So at the very beginning of Wallace's book in the introduction, Never Enough, she talks about a young junior in high school that she meets in Washington State named Molly. And Molly tells her about many of her peers who are on the advanced placement track in, their high, in the high school there who get up at 3 a.m. in the morning to study and finish papers before the day begins at school. And Molly says, I'm not like that. I get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> and Wallace asks her, apparently, you know, how does she manage with only five hours of sleep given all the... The, the, the goals that she's going after. She's on the varsity track team. How does she sustain her energy? And Molly says, well, um, at track practice, when I'm running around the track, I just close my eyes. And Wallace says that might be the perfect image for what she's describing in her book. High achievers running in circles with their eyes closed. Please, please don't hear me su suggesting don't encourage your children to succeed. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that is not the direction we want to encourage our children and our youth or our friends and our neighbors to think that's where they will find what matters most, where they will find true flourishing. So I want to close with just an interview I was listening to also last week uh, with John Tyson, an Australian-born pastor in New York City, a very wise guy. Uh, he's the pastor of Church of the City in New York. And this is a quotation from him from that interview that I agree with very much. The good news about secularism is that it is a failing story. Jesus and the kingdom of God have never looked better for an anxious, overwhelmed, and burdened generation to have Jesus say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn from me. This is good news. End quote.
He's talking about the young adults that he sees in his churches in New York City. So this low and this dangerous moment in our cultural life is perhaps a glorious moment for the church. At least churches that are filled with people who more and more want to learn how to abide in Jesus, who more and more are learning how to love his Father, learning more and more how to love the people that Jesus loves himself, who is everybody, and to love the works that Jesus does. And more and more trust that we could not matter any more than we could possibly imagine to him who died for us and rose again. To abide in that, to abide in the vine who is Jesus, is the abundant life of true flourishing. The life he gives to us, and not for our sake only, oh no, but that we who live lives knowing why we matter and to whom we praise for mattering as we do, would be a witness perhaps beginning in our own families, but also to our friends and to our neighbors and to this city. Amen.